Okay. So good evening and welcome. I everybody. can't hear anybody. Is it my me? problem? Can you hear me? Uh, selamat malam. And welcome to today's discussion. Uh, my name is Aditya Pri Pascal and I'm a international relations student in University of Ravijaya, my last year. And uh, I would like to welcome you to today's discussion, which is about uh, Nampak Marxisme di Dunia Ketiga. And today we are joined by uh, Mr. Vijay Prasad. Mr. Uh, Mr. Vijay Prasad, how are you? Hope you're doing well. So happy to be with you, by the way. Yes. Thanks, Thank Radit. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Vijay Prasad is a historian. He's also a journalist and, an, and the executive director of Tri-Continental uh, Institute for Social Research. And he's also an author of 30 books, which, is, uh, which includes The Darker Nations, a people's um, history of the third world, For Our Nations, a possible history of the global south, and uh, the red star over the third world, which will be the underlying theme of our discussion today. So without wasting any more time, Mr. Vijay, if you please, you have all the time in the world. Yes, now, Raditya, you have to tell me, what do you, what would you like me to do? Would you like me to talk a little about the book? Would you like to, do you have, would we just like to go, if people have read the book, we can just go to questions. Shall I spend about 10, 15 minutes talking about the book? Would you like that? I think that would be good, sir. Because, okay, um, fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fine. Uh, I, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. Well, um, this is the book. And I'm happy that my friend Ronnie decided to translate it and make such a beautiful cover. So that's that's a very great thing. Um, you know, I I am 54 years old and I came of age in the 1980s um, when um, the possibility of uh, the cleavage, the divide in the world still existed. What I mean is that we had a Soviet bloc, uh, which appeared to me sitting in Calcutta. Um, it appeared to me to be, uh, you know, a, a present uh, entity in the world. It was not going to disappear. And there was, of course, um, the People's Republic of China. Um, and there was um, um, Yugoslavia and Cuba. And a very large number of countries in the world were in the socialist bloc. And um, for people like myself who went to the left, we had great sense of, of possibility, you know, that we could advance uh, some of our own interests in place like India along the axis of socialism, um, you know, and, and so that, that's an important part of the context. And then very rapidly, I, I want to stress this for you, it, the demise of the USSR took place overnight. Uh, between 1989 and 1991, a series of events took place and Gorbachev essentially uh, disbanded the USSR. Uh, this was a, a coup against the Soviet Revolution. Uh, I, I actually think of it, and, and I'm, I may sound strange to you for saying so, um, but it was a coup because there was no real mass movement to disband the USSR. Um, it was an internal struggle in the highest levels of the Soviet party where a lot of rot had crept in, uh, a lot of ideological, um, you know, drift. Uh, Gorbachev was at the center of this ideological drift. To his right was Boris Yeltsin, um, who was really like a gangster uh, character. And they, between the kind of liberals around Gorbachev and the right around Yeltsin, um, including the Russian nationalist right, they disbanded the USSR, um, you know, and you got to remember the USSR was only about 70 years old. That's striking. You know, I, I actually, sorry, I didn't check. I don't know what the life expectancy is in Indonesia, but in many of our countries, the life expectancy is about 70 years. Uh, this is the life of a person. The USSR was born in 1917 and died in 1991, uh, the life expectancy of a person um, in our kind of countries. Um, so imagine um, what can a country do in 70 years? How can you judge a project 
based on a 70 year history um it's it's cruel in a way to to firstly judge the soviet experiment uh, as if it had had one two three lifetimes to develop and it's also even more cruel to judge communism or socialism uh, based on the experience of the ussr by itself because it's only one experiment in one country a poor country and it only lasted for seven decades now for many of you who are young who are in college who are just coming out into the world 70 years looks like a long time um, you're 22 years old 24 years old whatever it is you think of 70 as being ancient um, but let me tell you time goes very quickly friends and 70 years is not much time uh, indonesia won its independence in 1948 a very bloody independence not a peaceful transition of power um, and then you know in 1965 today on 30th September, one phase was ended. Think about how long that phase lasted. Um, just think about that. Uh, the events of 30th September took place 10 years after Bandung. Bandung conference takes place in 1955. In 1965, the entire political scene in Indonesia changes. Um, you know, that's 17 years you had, not 70, 17 years of your experiment. Um, you know, in a, in, a, in a very complicated place. So I was interested in the lead up to the 100th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution of October 1917. I was very interested, how are people going to remember first the Bolshevik Revolution as an act of 1917? And secondly, how will they remember the USSR? Well, it wasn't, uh, didn't take too much brain power to understand how they would remember this and I'll give you quickly a few ways in which people did remember uh, the Bolshevik revolution and the USSR. There was no difference between the right wing and the liberals on this. No difference. Both of them saw the USSR as an authoritarian waste of, uh, of time and waste of space and they saw the Bolshevik revolution as a coup um, which took place uh, led by people who had no uh, mass support. So it was authoritarian from the get go, from the beginning. That's how most of the liberals and most of the conservatives, right wing and so on, saw the Bolshevik revolution. Okay, that's their way of seeing it. Then there was the left. The left in the Western parts of the world, including my friend Tariq Ali and others, um, had the typical short-sighted view of the USSR. They saw the USSR or the Bolshevik revolution as somehow made inside the genius head of Lenin. And uh, after Lenin, everything went terrible. And it was a disaster. Uh, not just Stalin, but the whole thing was a disaster. There was nothing good in the USSR. And it was basically what they call state capitalism and, and so on and so forth. So even in the left and not just in the Western countries, but even in the global South countries, there was an impatience with the USSR and what it had done. And there was almost relief that it was no longer there. Um, I, I want to say this again, in some left quarters, there's relief that the USSR is not there. So you don't have to defend it, um, you know, uh, internationally that, oh, it's gone, fine. So I had decided in the lead up to, um, the anniversary, I knew these were going to be the two kinds of accounts. One would say it was a total disaster, authoritarian and so on. And then close to us on the left, people would say, nah, it's a wreck. After Lenin, it's a wreck. It was only Lenin. Imagine this. It's a total great man theory. And I'm saying this with a drawing of Lenin sitting above my head. You know, you see it by a Chinese artist. Um, I'm saying that with the drawing of Lenin. Lenin was not a great man. Lenin was a, was a comrade. And he was in a movement with lots of other people. And he summarized the collective thinking. And he was able to advance, help advance their process. But it's not Lenin, you know, like a, like a genius. And then Stalin, like a brute. You know, it's a ridiculous way to understand history. But even people on the left were looking at it like that. So I said, well, what would, what's a better way? Two things. Firstly, I wanted to start understanding why it is that socialist or communist revolutions 
take place in poor countries. You know, USSR, Mongolia, Vietnam, China, Cuba, and so on. Why do socialist revolutions only take place in poor countries? Why aren't they taking place in the rich countries? That was the first thing I wanted to um, emphasize and discuss. And what I did was um, I wanted to, related to that was to figure out how did they make a revolution in Russia? What was the theory? And that's the developing theory of national liberation Marxism, which a group of us in Tricontinental are trying to develop. So in this chapter, um, it's a great picture of Lenin at his desk. Uh, you start seeing um, the, the sense of what was Lenin's theory and how did Lenin settle accounts with liberals and all that. And then as we go into the book um, and the next chapter, which is on October itself, um, you know, here we, we get a, uh, I try to lay out a little bit. What is Lenin's thinking about imperialism? How does he feel a revolution can be built? And he makes a number of breakthroughs, you know, for instance, that the peasantry is not an unproductive class, but a productive class. Therefore, the peasants are actually workers. They just work in fields. Uh, they work in factories in the field. And so the worker peasant alliance um, is actually just a worker alliance with the peasantry highlighted of uh, emphasis. Um, so that, that's an important thing. Secondly, he understood through his theory of imperialism that because of the um, advantages of imperialism, the working class in the West will not rise up. Uh, that was a great thought of his, you know. Then he, he another thought was that we have the left has to um, has to adopt the national liberation movement because you have to break the ties with colonialism. Uh, colonialism is not going to advance your productive forces. It's not going to advance you to socialism. It will keep you down. So that was the first thing I wanted to emphasize was what is this theory of national liberation Marxism? And in fact, um, next month I'm going to release a, a book which has got selections from Ho Chi Minh and these are all many of them new selections translated from Vietnamese the front the introduction is going to develop this idea of national liberation Marxism the second point is that after the revolution took place it was enormously um, influential in the third world why because you see in the third world we looked at um, the Tsarist Empire and we said you know if these peasants can make a revolution if these peasants can do it we can do it they are backward peasants like us you know uh, they don't have the great sophistication of wealth you know uh, they, they are struggling to uh, to till their field with sticks they've just emerged out of serfdom if they can rise up and overthrow autarky and Europe in a way because the Russian Revolution was a revolution against Europe. It was a third world revolution. That's part of the argument in the book. Um, if that, they can do it, we can do it. And that's one. Secondly, in 10 years, they advanced the cause of the people so much. In the first 10 years, till 1927. And that was enormously influential. Um, and I wanted to capture that. You know, Why did people like Ho Chi Minh? Why did people like M.N. Roy? Why did Tan Malaka, for instance? Why did these people get inspired by what was happening in, in, in the Soviet Union, not just in Moscow and in Leningrad, but also in Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and, you know, Dushanbe and in, in Samarkand, um, you know, th these are wretchedly poor places. Why were people inspired? And that's what drew them. You know, Ho Chi Minh, in fact, says, uh, I am, you know, uh, I saw the light after I, I saw what happened in the Soviet Union and read Len. Um, so these are the two main themes I wanted to draw out. Um, I also wanted to write a short book so people can read it and they don't get overwhelmed, you know, by a giant detailed account. Um, in fact, uh, Lukman is telling me he's read Washington Bullets. I mean, the point about the new writing I want to do is I want to make these little books that uh, so that young people can be drawn into some of these thinkings um, without being intimidated by it. You know, uh, that's a formal thing. So I'm experimenting this uh, Red Star was the first experiment. 
how to write a book of this kind uh, where it, it packs a lot of information and analysis, but it's still, you know, not, it's not too long, you know, um, you can be not be intimidated by it. Left books are so intimidating. I don't know if you agree with me, but sometimes they are so intimidating. You know, I'm, I'm surrounded by them at home. And um, after the time I, I, I picked them up, you know, uh, whether it's, it's a great Hungarian Marxist, and I'm being unfair to pick on Mazaros, but you know, this is uh, Mazaros's book, Beyond Capital. And you know, it's a giant forbidding book. And I might as well just read Capital um, and struggle through it. But you know, th these are important books. I don't want to say anything that dissuades you from reading it. In fact, Mazaros, the great Hungarian Marxist, very important to read. But I said, let's go in a different direction. Let's try to produce something that you might be able to finish reading, you know, um, as an introduction. So, um, Raditya, I think that's a, enough to say in the beginning. Yes, sir. That was a very succinct explanation of the book. Thank you for filling that. I think um, uh, there, there are a few uh, participants who already have some questions. If you have Good. any questions, you can uh, raise your hand if you want to uh, speak, or you could write your questions in the chat answer. So, so are there anyone who wants to ask questions to Mr. PJ? We'll have probably a discussion for about one hour or one hour and a half. It's up to you, Mr. PJ. Oh, one hour is good. Uh, one hour is good. Yeah, let's see how it goes, okay? Uh, yeah. Is there anyone who has any questions? Well, before a question comes, why don't you tell me a little bit about what you're studying? Oh, me personally? Yes. Well, I'm studying international relations, sir. And uh, well, uh, personally, me, myself, I'm not really, um, you know, understanding a lot about ideologies. In fact, I only studied them for one semester in the start of uh, my freshman year, in the first semester. So um, what are you I not understanding? Mm -hmm. What are well, you not understanding? There are, you know, there's just a lot to learn, sir, about ideologies, especially Marxism, you know. But I do have some friends who are really keen on Marxism and capitalism and so on. And I, I kind of stand in the middle of it all. And I'm trying to just understand what is it about in the first place. And by reading your book, I mean, I have, I have a lot of insights, new insights, you know, even, uh, even insights that I don't read in any other books from uh, Karl Marx or Lenin's book or Tan Malaka's book, for instance. Well, I think it's very, very insightful. Yeah, so thank you for the book. Well, I'm just going to say one thing for you, to you. Mm -hmm. The best way to judge an ideology is how it, um, how it deals with hunger. Mm -hmm. You know, how does it deal with hunger? Um, in a capitalist society, how does capital how does a capitalist government um, proceed to deal with hunger what are its its policy options and if you look at it like that it's quite clarifying you can in fact make a chart you know indonesia struggles with a great endemic hunger problem here's hunger here's a set of capitalist policies to deal with hunger here's a set of socialist policies to deal with hunger let's let's evaluate that you know, it's a practical problem, a real, practical, genuine problem. What are the ways we have to deal with it? I, I generally, my orientation is don't start with the, the big theory. Start with the problem. And then you can come to the, you can, you can go from a material problem back up to the abstract theory. So that's the so, best way to start learning about ideology. If I was to teach you how to deal with the array of ideologies out there, this is how I would begin, my friend. I would ask you, what is the liberal way? Liberals would say the state should not intervene too much. Let leave it to the charity or the private sector. Okay, that's one approach to hunger. Let charity organizations deal with it. Let the private sector deal with it. 
then a neoliberal might come in and say, ah, okay, what we're going to do is let the market figure it out. Market is the best allocator of resources. Well, then we look at places where they've had at least 20 years of market-based allocation of resources. And we find it actually doesn't do a very good job of feeding people. You know, and then what is the socialist approach? Socialist approach will say, you have to do two things. You have to empower the people economically. Nobody wants to live in a world of charity. I don't want to live in a world where somebody's, I have to go and stand in a line and then some, you know, charity gives me a box of food. I want to live with dignity. So you see what I mean? That's how we deal with the different things. I see some questions are coming in. Yeah, I'm sorry for, for interrupting. Please, no, 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 this is not a, it's a conversation. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, okay, Nadia. Uh, Nadia, yeah. sorry. Uh, can I say something before um, the questions start coming in? Of course. Um, okay, so um, uh, I see that people have started asking questions in in the chat section. So I just wanted to come in. This is not really a question, but um, I just want to say that when I first uh, read the book, um, I read the first paragraph of the preface and I started uh, weeping. I just um, wept. Um, the book uh, was written in a way that is so gentle. And I, I think I was really surprised by how easy it is to read the book, by um, um, how page turning it is. Um, uh, and, um, you know, I don't know, just uh, I was so touched by the softness uh, of the book that I just um, couldn't stop crying uh, when I read the book. Um, uh, what I'm trying to say is, I think um, the basis of communism is love. And uh, I think um, Vijay Prashad showed it very clearly, expressed it very um, well in this book, how the basis of communism is love, love for the people, love for yourself. Um, it's the um it's it's wanting people to live um to live uh, everyone to live comfortably where um nobody is oppressed um yeah so um i just i guess i just want to say thank you uh, thank you so much for being here uh, i just i just wanted to say um how your book has touched um the heart of so many people and um being a communist i think um uh means loving the people around you and um this book just reminds me of how much i love communism and how much um we can achieve um this we can achieve this society with love uh with love um for each other we can do this yeah, uh, so I just, I guess I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Well, that was so beautiful and so moving. And you're so correct in everything you said. The first thing I would say is, in fact, if you read the book in Indonesian, then you have to also thank my uh, translator, Ronnie, um, because you were reading his words, um, you know, and, and that's there. Um, but you're so right about the importance of love for humanity. And I think many times in any movement, um, that aspect is forgotten. But what you said was so moving and I'm so touched by it. Thanks a lot. Right. Thank you. Um, I think there are... Nadia raised hand first. Nadia, if you want to ask a question, please. Enter now. Nadia Zafira. Right. Nadia? Are you here? I think she's disconnected. Right, okay. Um, there are two raised hands. I think we'll go with Arkan first. <laughs> 
and then I'll go to the chat for questions. Yeah. Uh, good evening or good morning, Mr. Vijay Prasad, and thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is Arkan. I'm from Yogyakarta. And before I ask the question, I would like to uh, thank Mr. Vijay Prasad for write, uh, writing this book. Uh, I've read this book uh, and it's translated by uh, Ronnie. And I really love this book because it is very easy to read and easy to digest, uh, especially for me who has no uh, prior knowledge on the Marxism and such. And I also uh, listen to the People's Dispatch podcast, uh, Give People What They Want by uh, Mr. Vijay Prashad because it is very, uh, uh, it, it really uh, is easy to digest and all the information from around the world were uh, presented with the uh, working class perspective. And one question I would like to ask to Mr. Vijay Prashad is in the last chapter of this book, you when you uh, recall your memory of communism, you mentioned the West Bengal and also uh, Kolkata and all this stuff. And one of the most striking thing about the people movement in India is uh, the success of the Marxist uh, party in Kerala. And one of the most uh, interesting things that I noticed is about the people's science, people's science movement uh, and how it popularized science among the common people. And I would like to ask for Indonesian if we want to start something like the popular science movement, uh, what are the things that we need to uh, start to uh, start uh, dissecting the knowledge to the common people, especially the uh, people in the rural area? Thank you very much. Wow, that is a beautiful thought. Um, so, um, I mean, Arkan, I'm going to say a few things. One, go online and read up on the people's health movement. Um, actually, at People's Dispatch, People's Health Movement has a weekly uh, publication there. You can read it there. But look up the People's Health Movement. You see, the, the key thing about advancing the cause of humanity, in my opinion, is to bring reason into the world. That's a big part of our task. Um, you know, reason doesn't actually exist. Reason is just a set of ideas. You know, it has, it has to animate people. Um, so, for instance, when a pandemic comes, um, how do we behave with each other? Uh, do we behave with rationality or do we behave with fear? You know, when the WHO said, look, it transmits through aerial means, whether aerosol or droplets, it was not clear initially, but close your nose and mouth. It doesn't transmit through the skin. So if you wore a mask, if you washed your hands before you touched your face, right? You likely would not transmit COVID-19. That means you could actually see other people because you're not transmitting it through your eyeballs. But so much fear took place that people then barricaded themselves at home. You know, thinking that just by... So in, in the, the general slogan given was, we want social distance. Now in Kerala, the government said, this is a terrible slogan. What we want is physical distance, but social solidarity. We don't want social distance. So this was part of the, in a sense, the science movement. So you got to start slowly when you build a science movement. You can't come out the I mean, I know in India, we made lots of mistakes. I was not part of it, but by we, I mean the science movement. They made a lot of mistakes because they came out and first started attacking religion, attacking superstition openly, you know, saying that that's a superstitious thing. Why are you doing it? You can't, you can't drink water and pretend it's a medicine. They attacked homeopathy. This is a mistake. I don't think you, you do that. Marx has a very interesting formula in his text on the Jewish question. He says, the point isn't to liberate yourself personally and stand apart from society and attack religion. The point is to first understand what does religion do for society? What does superstition do for society? And I don't, I'm not equating religion and superstition. They're two different things. What does superstition do, you know? Listen, I might be a Marxist, I might think of myself pretty rational, but I'm also superstitious every once in a while. 
superstition fulfills the need for clarity when we don't know something when we are unclear about something you know when my children were young and would go to school before they left on their first day of school i used to put a little sugar in their mouth that's an old indian custom you know sweeten your mouth before you go for your first day of a job or school if you win a promotion in your job put something sweet in your mouth i don't know if you have that in indonesia shakkar mu me shakkar you know put sugar in the mouth this is a custom it's not something bad what's wrong with that you 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 has your birthday i put some cake in your mouth it's the same thing that itself is not superstition so you can't attack everything you know you can't attack your culture so a science movement has to be very careful not to end up being an attack on a culture you understand what i'm saying we want to develop people's sense of look you know you've got an illness there's a cure for it tying a, a string around your hand is not going to cure you there's a cure let let me share with you the idea or um vaccines are good for you and so on uh, so what i'm trying to say arkan is that it's a great idea to think of starting a science popular science movement and there are various ways to do it you know one way to do it is to explore with people for instance what are the new technologies to prevent climate change what are the new technologies do public exhibitions in your town put up posters saying you know can can our town be 100% solar what would what would it take do we how much sunlight do we have in the year study it a little bit look at the meteorological association what's the level of sunlight in my town you know how many uh, solar panels would it require you have to do a study then you start a popular campaign saying can we go solar and then you know at least our town is not contributing to climate change do you see what i mean practical things which capture people's imagination not attacks on culture i think that's often becomes a mistake but look at the people's health movement because it's a part of the science movement trying to improve people's health you know um in india for instance there are lots of very simple um illnesses uh, that could be cured with very simple vaccines starting a mass campaign saying you know we need to get access to these vaccines so our children don't get elephantitis and bilharzia and all this other stuff you know um that that's that's the way those campaigns start if you if you ever want any uh you know assistance on this write to me i'll introduce you to people in the people science movement in india okay you can find me easily on the tri continental blog just don't write too long an email okay arkan that's a important thing if it's too long a email i may not finish reading it thank okay. you very much mr appreciate brush that right i believe nadia zafira first raise her hand so okay. can you may nadia okay thank you so much uh vijay i'm so sorry my intro was cut off so uh my name is nadia i'm actually a student of i am here uh, at ugm at international students ugm so yeah i think must i am introduced to me a lot about like the uh very um uh, marxist influence Uh, writings and really opened my eyes to a lot of the structuralist uh, perspectives on uh, global politics, for example, which was really interesting for me. Um, my question is actually related to uh, it's more of like an economic question, I guess, because I'm taking a class on Latin American politics, right? And then one of the things that uh, one of the key points of interest in that class is. Uh, Leftist-driven regional projects like UNASUR and uh, UNASUR and CELAC and and how these uh, regional projects they actually like they've actually reversed much of the neoliberal uh, regionalisms in Latin America like Mercosur which is very influenced by the Washington consensus consensus right but uh, on the other hand these regional projects they, they depend on like uh, the Latin American extractive economies 
which we know are very vulnerable to external shocks, right? We can rely on, uh, we can always rely on uh, the exploitation of uh, natural gas and oil, for example, to fund uh, redistribution policies. And so uh, Latin American countries, obviously they've tried to experiment with like uh, product diversification, for example, but they can't do that because these uh, legacies left by colonialism and imperialism, they're very hard to reverse. Like for example, in Cuba, uh, they relied on the sugar industry to really fund uh, their socialist model of uh, economy. And so I just wanted to know, uh, uh, Mr. Vijay, like, what is your opinion? What do you think is the role of extractive economies in uh, redistributive models of uh, of redistributive models of economy? Like, what is the role of uh, um, what is the role of extractive economies in uh, Marxism, for example? Because we know that perspective from eco Marxism, we know that uh, Marx himself he didn't view man as separate from nature. He viewed man as something that is. Uh, intrinsic with nature, for example, he, he saw a very uh, interconnected relationship between man and nature. He didn't see nature as something that was subjugated or subordinated to man, but something that is equal. So what do you think about that? Thank you so much, Vijay. Well, firstly, that's a really good, sophisticated question. And there's a lot in there that is important. The first thing is that the, um, you know, after the, the collapse of the USSR, there was a period opened up where the World Trade Organization was established in 1994. Uh, many of the third world trade and development forums like the UN Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD, were weakened. Um, the uh, OECD, which is the Organization of Economic Cooperating, uh, I've forgotten what it even stands for. It's basically the European Trade and Development Body strengthened and essentially what happened was that the United States and its principal allies began to define economic, international economic policy, you know, free trade, liberalization and so on. And um, the barriers to uh, the, um, these, these definitions of politics and then the actual creating of institutions like the World Trade Organization, the barriers just were not there. And countries were basically having to give in, to surrender to these policies. Um, when Hugo Chavez wins the election in Venezuela in 1998, now remember this, Soviet Union collapses in 1991. 1994, the World Trade Organization is created. Four years later, Chavez wins an election. Um, this is a monumental election because Chavez very early on understands Venezuela cannot stand on its own, even though it was at the time a major oil exporting country, cannot stand on its own, it will be crushed. In fact, there was an attempted coup against a military coup in 2002. So he takes office in 1999, wins election 98, takes office 99, 2002 the coup against him. So he recognizes the need for Venezuela to be yoked to other um, entities. So in 2004, between 2004, 2006, they start to create a whole set of different regional bodies. Um, CELAC, the community of Latin American and Caribbean states, uh, UNASUR, um, ALBA, the Bolivarian area of the Americas and so on. These regional platforms appear. Now, those of us who looked at these things closely made the argument that regionalism, regionalism was a barrier to the kind of top-down WTO imposed policies. But regionalism was the barrier and it was a place to experiment with new ways of organizing economies. It was not an answer. It's a barrier and it's a place of experimentation. You see, in Asia, we simply don't have that, um, that possibility. Um, you know, China went in a slightly different direction. Uh, China decided to, um, you know, at, in those that period in the 1990s, China decided to integrate fully with the WTO um, or quite as fully as possible. In that period, went in a different direction. China has pivoted a lot since 2013, has changed its orientation a lot. Now it's creating not regionalism, Belt and Road Initiative is not regionalism. It's creating a new global project. Um, 
which is different than regionalism. And in fact, therefore, they are breaking through the limitations of regionalism. Regionalism is a bulwark, a defense against a shield, and it's a way to experiment with policies. Belt and Road is not region. Belt and Road is a different way. It's it's offering an alternative. Now it's offering an alternative within the structures of international capitalism. It's not producing international socialism. It's within the structures of inter but it's certainly an alternative. So that's how I see what those regional platforms had been or, or are still. They still exist. Um, but we also have to think beyond regionalism. And that's where the new conversation, it's an old term, but the new conversation around multipolarity, that's where that exists. Can we think now not just of regionalism, but integrating regions to each other globally? You know, I'll, I'll give you a, 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 a silly example. You remember when you were much, now you're still a young person, Nadia, but when you were a much younger person and you were sitting, eating your meal with your parents and so on, and when you were smaller, you basically were just absorbing everything they did and said. And I don't mean that need to talk politics or anything, but even gossip and things, you just absorb. Then as you get stronger and stronger, and as you get more confident in your abilities, you remember that feeling. You can interrupt them and say, hey, listen, but that's not a correct thing to say. That aunt of mine isn't such a bad person. She's actually quite polite. And your parents look at you and think, what? When did you get the confidence to say something like that? You know, you understand? You remember that now when you sit down with your parents, you can talk more freely. So I'm using this. It's a very bad analogy because countries should not be thought of as children. But we are children when it comes to the power dynamic. Regionalism incubates a place for confidence building. We build our confidence. Then we stand together. You see the last CELAC meeting in Mexico this month in, in September. The uh, community of Latin American Caribbean states met in, in Mexico City. Very, very bold pronouncements about the future of the world that they made, you know, and against the imposition of US power and so on. Um, that's a sign of confidence. So, you know, we don't look for the exact answer to everything. As, as, a, as a person committed to advancing the cause of humanity, what we are interested in is looking for the dynamic, the processes. It's, it's a very narrow way to say, what's the answer? What's the solution? We don't look for solutions. Those of us who are influenced by Marxist thinking, we are not looking for solutions. Socialism is just a word. It's not a solution. We're looking to advance the cause of humanity. We're looking for processes. We're looking for dynamics. And we must see their limitations and their advantages and so on. OK? Yeah, that's actually really interesting because like um, I think a lot of the discussion around, uh, especially in, in UGM, like a lot of the discussion uh, surrounds like South-South cooperation and building, you know, regionalisms in the South as a way to kind of like, um, as a way to build up this strength collectively and pool resources together instead of just like standing alone. Um, but that's an interesting, uh, that's an interesting notion that regionalism is actually not like, it's not all that great because, you know, in, in the, to a certain extent, like um, these countries still have to face the hegemon hegemonic like forces of international capitalism, for example. Um, but I feel like you haven't answered my, my second question. It was more about the role of uh, extractive economies in uh, socialism. Um, yeah, what do you think yes, about that? Sure. So, I mean, look, um, uh, you know, we are theorizing in tricontinental the concept resource socialism. Um, you know, the United States is, I think, 4% of the world's population and uses about annually about 26, 27% of the world's resources. Um, that's not a sustainable, uh, that's not a sustainable way to live. Um, why should you condemn a country like Afghanistan, for instance, uh, to backwardness? 
because you say, well, we shouldn't use our resources. You know, Afghanistan has perhaps three trillion dollars of resources. Um, I just published a, a report on um, on Badakhshan, the northern province, where it's filled with lapis lazuli and so on. Um, the problem is that the smugglers are making the money. The government is making zero money. Uh, the people are making zero money. You know, all of these minerals and resources, the Pentagon, US military, released a report 10 years ago saying Afghanistan is the Saudi Arabia of lithium. Who's making the money from all this? It's the private sector. So the point isn't keep things in the soil, take things out. We have to be aware of the ecosystem and not try to damage it. But at the same time, whether you like it or not, these things are being utilized. The question is to what end are they being utilized? You know, uh, to what end? And I think there, there's a lot to learn from Bolivia uh, under the leadership of Evo Morales, because in 14 years, they were able to change the contracts for extraction of precious minerals and metals from Bolivia. Uh, if you compare what's going on in the Congo with what's going on in Bolivia, it's night and day. So look at the Bolivian example. Okay, Can I add one thing uh, regarding, you know, the issues of regionalism? Because there is something uh, unique. For example, in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Asia, the discourse of uh, regionalism in 1970s, 1980s, was actually they perceive regionalism as a basis, you know, uh, or for, uh, as a shield uh, against, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the negative impact of uh, economic integrations. And during that time, for example, uh, if you may know, you know, UNDP sponsored uh, ASEAN uh, to conceive ASEAN regionalism as a reg regional base of productions. At that time, we have like fertilizer developed in, uh, you know, uh, in uh, in Aceh, and uh, you know, seed produced in uh, in Thailand, and so on and so forth. But this project fell in tatters in 1990s. When uh, you know, uh, 1994, I think that the time is relatively the same what was happening in Latin America and with the establishment of the WTO, because then uh, regionalism was thought uh, not as a shield against the negative impact of econ global economic integrations, but it is conceived as a stepping stone to be integrated into you know, uh, into uh, into global uh, global economy. Uh, they you know. So uh, build their own regionalisms to be more friendly for, for example, foreign direct investment. They are competing each other to be, you know, to conceive regionalism as a base of market instead of uh, production. And this, you know, change a uh, plot in the landscape of Southeast Asian politics. Today. No, that's exactly correct. I mean, that's why regionalism itself is a relatively neutral concept. It can be for all kinds of things. Um, it need not be something progressive. Uh, it really depends on what we would call the class content of the regional um, block. You know, uh, it depends what the project is. Regionalism is merely a form. The content is provided by the project. And, you know, if it's a project of capitalist integration, regionalism is very good. Exactly what you said, Lukman. I mean, that's ASEAN. Um, APEC is very complicated. And uh, it's something to really study more. I, I don't know enough about it. Um, but my friend John Ross has very strong opinions about APEC being actually a positive step. And yeah, I, I, it's to be seen. <laughs> Nadia, do you have any more questions? Uh, no, I think Sorry. that's pretty much it. I just want to thank you, uh, Mr. Pasha, and obviously, Ms. Ayum, because like, um, I think like, you know, especially on this uh, very significant and, you know, it's a very historic moment in history today where like, um, like it's practically the death of communism and any left-leaning movements in Indonesia, but, you know, discussions like these, they keep, they keep uh, the hope for a, you know, for a potential socialist or Marxist future alive in Indonesia. Thank you so much. Amazing. Right, Mr. Vijay, I believe I have some questions for you from the chat. I'll read some of them. I'll try to get all of them, but I, it depends on the time, if you still have time to get. Like the first question would be from Christopher Emmanuel. I'll read it for you. Hello, Mr. Prashad. I have a question regarding your thoughts on Trotskyism and its role in the third international. 
Do you think in a way it actually hindered participation from the third world in joining the future international Congress as it denounces the anti-colonial movement? And also the second question. Also with the global South countries, what people's movement do you think is suitable and closely resembles the Indonesia communist movement and might be able to be implemented in today's Indonesian people's struggle? Yeah, so the first thing is, um, well, let's not go too much into the Trotskyism thing, but it's very clear that the, um, the orientation of the Trotsky movement has generally been against national liberation. And, you know, this starts with Trotsky himself being against the uprising in Ireland in 1916, um, the Fenian uprising. Um, and it goes right through the analysis of like the Cuban state as being state capitalist and so on and so forth. Um, one of the things that I find about Trotskyism is the desire to find perfection in the world. But our movement, as I said just earlier, you know, to Nadia is not about, we're not seeking perfection. We're seeking to advance the cause of humanity. And, you know, you can't, we, we are not, we are not sitting this is not a, a university seminar attitude, you know, that what's even in university seminar, it's a bad attitude to take, you know, we, we don't, we are not like the Pope saying this is good, this is bad, this is bad, this is worse. That's a terrible attitude to the left. You've got to understand who is trying to advance the cause of people, what's the dynamic, what are the processes, you know, what's the um, the movement, what are they struggling with? What are their constraints? What are their possibilities? The balance of forces and so on. Generally, Trotskyism doesn't bother with all that. It's much better at making a delineation. This is good, this is bad. And so I, I find that sets it apart, which is why Trotskyism actually has not been able to root itself in the third world. It's mainly a European and North American kind of uh, academic ideology. Um, which is all very well, but it should not interfere with what we are trying to build, is what I'm trying to say. Um, the second thing is, you asked what, you know, is a suitable, you know best what's better for your society, you know, and I, it, it's what I was saying to Raditya before. Um, ask yourself, ask the people around you, you know, um, I don't know what the rate of hunger or despair is in Indonesia, but the question um, people's movement always asks first, is what is the project that our leadership has in, in the capital cities of our countries? What is the project they have to get rid of hunger, illiteracy, ill health, and so on? They don't have a project. You have to build a project around those concrete, tangible issues. You don't build a project around Marxism, if you understand what I mean. You don't build a project around an abstraction. You have to build a project around first, a mass project around dealing with concrete, actual issues in the world. Now, you may need to develop your own clarity, your own theoretical understanding. You may need to develop, you know, sharpen your, your thoughts on the anvil of Marxism and so on. But the politics you create in the world, you don't walk out of your house with a big red flag and saying, walk after me. Why should people follow you? You're not actually reflecting anything of their concerns. But if you come out with a sign that says, you know, abolish hunger today, then somebody may follow you. They may come with you. They may participate with you. They will walk with you. That's how we build a people's struggle. It's around tangible issues. If your government was solving all the tangible issues, then you're all set. But the chances are they are not. And that's the question. You know, that's what you raise for people. Right, Christopher, that's, I think that's about it. Christopher, yeah. does that answer your question? I think it does. And then another question from the chat, Mr. PJ, um, from Alan. Hi, my name is Alan, student of social work in one of the, one of the universities in Malaysia. Since you just said that nobody wanted to live in, a, in charity, it strikes me. Social work did not work as a catalyst from direct effect of capitalism to welfare, to reform, and social justice. I'm reading theory of alienation through Oscar Wilde's work. Hmm. Very heavy, heavy read. 
it is one of the important knowledge in helping individuals and communities. And it is important in third world country, but it is somehow conflicting. Would love to have insight of Marxism on this. Thank you. You know, there's a big difference between building a, a well, I'm glad you're reading Oscar Wilde because he is quite hilarious and so interesting uh, to read. But here's the, the just very quickly on your question. In the Bible, actually, there's a line which says, um, if you give a man a fish, he eats for a day. If you teach him how to fish, he eats for his life. You know, um, that actually, that's an Abrahamic concept. It's better to teach somebody to do something than to give them something. Now, in the middle of a crisis, we give. When there's a, a crisis, we give. We go as people of the left, we produce relief stations, we provide relief to people. That's different. But we don't build a policy around charity. We have to build a policy around dignity. Dignity is more important than charity. And the way you create a politics against alienation is to improve people's sense of themselves, their dignity. So that's what I would say in that case is that our orientation, our movement is about teaching people how to fish and not only individually, but teaching them how to fish collectively, you know, taking care of people's sense of their capacity, their possibilities and so on. You know, Amartya Sen has a liberal concept called capabilities, where you have to improve the capabilities of people. I like that concept a lot. I think we can absorb it. We have to improve the capabilities of people. They have to have confidence. They have to have the ability to understand, um, you know, what they can do, what they should do, and so on. Okay. All right. And then I'm sorry, I had to turn off my video because there's a lot of people. It's okay. Me. And I'll probably get to the race and questions first. So. And I think I'll get Sarina. Sarina, if you will. Oh, thank you. Um, hello, um, I'm Sarina. I'm a labor lawyer. Now I'm studying labor policies and globalization at Castle University. Um, as I can say, I've been involving in movements since uh, for uh, 15 years and since I was 18. And I feel uh, very relate with, with what you uh, said. As my, uh, I, I want to talk about, I would like to ask about Lenin. Um, as my experience, um, many activists uh, say Lenin is uh, hard to follow. Or the concept uh, bring, uh, brings uh, the movement to authorita authoritarian at the end. Uh, but I can say um, the Lenin concept is uh, necessary in order to build a strong organization under capitalism, uh, especially if we have uh, been involving in labor movement for all time. Uh, we can really uh, understand um, why the Lenin, um, Lenin's model of organization uh, is necessary. Um, however, I realize um, the young uh, generation is very far from uh, this tradition to build uh, organization, especially if we uh, talk about um, building a uh, party, left party, moreover, a revolutionary party. And especially in Indonesia, we experience uh, the erasing of the uh, memory and tradition of building uh, mass organizations under the Soeharto era. Um, and I can say that I have, um, I have did um, practice for last nine years um, in labor organization. And, but it's very hard uh, because nowadays it's like, um, especially in Indonesia, many people want to join to organization, labor organization in only in order to fulfill their very short uh, interests. I can understand if this is uh, happening to the young organization, but I can see the older generation 
also have uh, no sense of the needs to organize themselves, uh, especially in a left party. Uh, so at the end in Indonesia, uh, a Leninist party is more like a claim uh, then it's truly following a professional revolutionary uh, model, a Lenin party model. And what do you think uh, about this? Uh, is it happening uh, globally or on Indonesia because of our unique history? Uh, th thank you. You know, um, the form of political organization should not be something that um, gets dictated to us. Um, different countries have different experiences they are in different stages of of uh, the po of possibility and so on um you know when i look back at at the history of indonesian the indonesian left um one of the core lessons that you take away from it is the immense encouragement of mass organizations and you know in including of course cultural work uh, at Tricontinental, we did a dossier on Lerka, which is beautiful. I, I highly recommend you go and have a look at it. I'll try to put the link to it in the chat. It's free to download. Um, it's, it's beautiful. Lerka was an amazing organization. And, you know, what the left did in Indonesia was it created a whole raft of organizations, you know, uh, front organizations, of cultural workers, Probably there was lawyers also, I don't know, um, you know, peasants, trade unions, all the big front, women's organization and so on. And the heart of the political movement was there, was in the mass organizations. Um, it's a long journey that you have, you know, let's be frank, it's a long journey. You can't, there's no shortcuts in this. And, but you have to take the first step. I mean. I believe right now that there's no other way to found a left project in a country unless you're immediately tackling the problem of hunger. I think hunger is the core issue of our time. And I really believe that, that you know, we can create the best political form formation and whatever come up with a really good outline of our understanding of the world and so on. But if we're not doing anything to tackle hunger, to organize people against the eradication of hunger and absolute poverty, um, we can't build a movement. And um, <clears throat> I think this is a key thing. You know, 2.37 billion people don't know when the next meal is coming from. That's one in three people on the planet. Th that to me is unbelievable. You know, it's unbelievable. I mean, we have more food than we need. We have more everything than we need, and yet we can't feed people. That's unbelievable. So, I mean, I, I'm just trying to say that you can't dictate the political form. But certainly from your own experience in Indonesia, the left was built through mass organizing. Um, I believe that, uh, but, you know, um, you know, uh, I decided to be a lawyer um, five years ago because I want to help the workers in order to uh, build a connection, a uh, very close connection with the workers and also move uh, from, move to the industrial zones. But, you know, uh, the situation is very hard here because I don't see the activists uh, do the same. They read lots of books, but they uh, forget to practice. They forget to even to, to make connection, to have that uh, direct, Con, uh, primary contact with the workers uh, themselves. Uh, they, don't, they don't do that. So it's very hard to, to have um, intellectual in one side and the uh, workers, especially uh, manufacturer workers in other side. So that's why um, I saw uh, every year we have uh, great movements, we have uh, um, big demonstrations in, in Jakarta or big cities but they can't uh, involve uh, or bring the workers to involve uh, with them. I mean, um, we, 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 we don't need to go too much into this, um, you know, in a way, uh, Sarina, because uh, there, there is a, a serious problem in our time with trade union organizing. 
and with the growth of a kind of uh, you know with with a socialist consciousness not being at the heart of trade union organizing um this is a global phenomena it's not i don't think your experience in indonesia is unique um and i think we one of the the lessons i've learned from looking at you know developments in kerala or in 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 bolivia even is how um trade unionism was revitalized by social movements movements in the fight against privatization of water supply for instance in 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 cochabamba and bolivia radicalized the workers workers who had become you know where the socialist consciousness had diminished um and so that's a, a interesting example um in kerala just watching the fight against covid-19 the trade unions mobilized and that experience radicalized the workers you know workers went out to bus stations and built sinks and so on that was not done by the state that was done by the trade union federation but that radicalized people because they had experience of public action again um you know the experience of public action is very radicalizing if you have 10 young students and you go out one day and you decide even to clean up a a street you know you do practical work cleaning the street beautifying your neighborhood you know planting trees those all those things sound like ngo things why should we surrender all that to ngos the experience for a young person of going out and doing that activity is very radicalizing it it, it invigorates you it gives you a sense of participation collective consciousness socializes you in a way and so on and trade unions have not been doing that kind of activity you know and so you end up where the union and the union lawyers become in a sense litigious you become legal the consciousness becomes legal and not socialist and i think that the we should emphasize like students you you are all students you should spend a day you know 30th september commemorated by cleaning up your street go out there do something practical and do something where ordinary people see you do something practical and saying i admire those young people not that they are marching up and down the street with slogans but they are out there helping people that's how we win the trust and love of the people by doing practical things do you, you know what i mean yeah, that's the socialist that. consciousness yeah uh, because we also have a a music a band and also we have a like public kitchen yeah basically we 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 have done everything uh, that you say but you know it's yeah i i, I say again that it's very um it's very hard because um, people who do this um, are still a very view it's this is the interesting part about why we need political organizations because part of building the fabric of society you know like having this public kitchen and all that it's very tiring and you're not sure what you're doing and you've got to therefore come back to your political organization every week or every two weeks and you meet each other and talk about what you're doing and assess the work and congratulate each other and make each other feel like you're actually in the middle of a process because it can be very lonely and i i mean i i'm sorry i i i basically uh, um i think a lot of building a left is building companionship and we are companions in a struggle together you know i mean uh, that that's what that's what a lot of our work is is it's building our own confidence with each other and with what we're doing so that's the that's the real thing in why having a regular political meeting is important that you you don't get stuck thinking what i'm doing is just charity but politics okay now uh, raditya how about 15 minutes more thank you of course sir that would be two three questions or yeah okay so now you asked no yeah i have to get myself a glass of water but you can ask the question i can hear you okay um okay okay so i think it would be better for me to does anyone want to raise their hand andri 
Um, this will be the last question. So I think Andre will have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. Uh, I think it's the, the important point, the, the important discussion. Uh, my name is Andre. Now I'm still in student movement, yeah. Sekolah Mahasiswa Progresif. Uh, I'm in in Jakarta. Uh, we we know Indonesian uh, Indonesia on U.S. imperialism hegemonic, yeah. And then we know we lose the second time, the first in RUKHP, and then we lose. Omnibus law, we know the, the regulation can make less movement stress, yeah, the labor stress, because the, the, the part of omnibus law talk about how imperialism can exist in Indonesia. Uh, and then we know uh, Indonesian left movement, I think, was tired. Yeah. And then how, how, how we uh, we need it now, like party, Labour Party, Left Party, but we know the history of on Indonesia. We we have uh, on sixty five, and then the last is was burned, and then how how we can rebuild the Revolutionary Party? How we can uh, make a new make a new party who exists who can exist in, in imperialism hegemonic i think we the first time like we we uh, we struggle with labor union the, the revolutionary labor union but we need more like a, a revolutionary party yeah I, I, my question is how we can rebuild the revolutionary party yeah thank you very much well again you know i i'm i'm not going to tell you how to build your own political forms because that's your experience and that's something you will have to do um but i am willing to say that that um you know these kind of conversations are valuable uh, building networks are valuable um, you know, you're in Jakarta, you find other like-minded people, you start a conversation, a reading group, a study group, uh, you start doing practical activities, the kind of things I said earlier, you know, uh, talking to people from the key classes, uh, learning what's happening, um, you know, uh, somebody like Sarina working as a lawyer uh, for trade unions, making contact with them, you know, we build our movement basically in the same old way. Nothing has changed. Uh, you can't build a movement online easily. You have to build it by meeting each other, talking, regular discussions, and so on. Um, it's actually all sounds very ordinary. You know, th there's no difference between building a revolutionary party and building any organization. The difference is in the content and in how we organize the organization, you know, the form of, uh, of hierarchies that we create and so on elected positions and things like that. But the bottom line is you have to build it by building it. And you build it by building it through the same old forms, conversation, activity, um, common programs, building a program and so on. Um, I, I want to say that, you know, Indonesia has had a great history of people's struggles, great history. Not only the left, you know, uh, up to 1965, not only the left, but also the great people's struggles that brought democracy. Um, you know, whatever the outcome, and the outcome wasn't, you know, some emancipatory outcome. But I well remember mass demonstrations in Indonesia against the, uh, the dictatorship. And that's powerful history and legacy. You have to be proud of your country, you know. Uh, you fought off the Dutch, you fought off the Japanese. You seized your own independence. It was not given to you. You know, your people are capable of a lot. And that history you have to recover. You know, you have to tell people that nobody gave you anything. You know, you fought to win your independence. 
um, you know, whatever complicated attitude you may have towards Sukarno today, um, Sukarno and others, they fought to create sovereignty for Indonesia. It's not easy to create a country out of a set of islands, you know, uh, same with Philippines. It's very difficult, um, you know, communications, building transportation networks and so on. They fought to build a country um, and you have to be proud of that. And any left project has to be built on pride in one's process. You know, it can't be built from somewhere else. You have to go back and study Tan Malaka, study ID, study all of that history. You have to study your own thinkers, you know, liberals, um, progressives of different kinds, not just the left. Try to see if the great liberal references or the people's references, the, the working class thinkers of the past can be brought into your project, you know, uh, not just Lenin from, from there or somebody from here or, you know, but your own histories and your own traditions must be brought in. Um, people must realize that Indonesia has a long history of the left and a proud history. And you will not allow that history to be disappeared. Can I be your last uh, question, please? Wait, let me uh, uh, okay, uh, one last uh, question. If Raditya is, is uh, who was speaking? I'm sorry. Uma Kacha. Uma Kacha. All right, Mr. Vijay, one more, one last question. Okay. Right, okay. Hello, my name is Gio. I'm still a student at Senior High School, actually. I'm sorry, I can't open my computer camera because I don't have them. So because the sentiment and negative stereotype of socialist communists, there's a lot of workers can be radicals here. I think they are afraid of government or the meat of communism. I agree that we must have connection with workers and we should have clean and strong left party. I'm not losing my faith, actually. I think we should delete the myth first. How do you think about that? What is the way to clean the negative myth in these people by reading a book? But there's a lot of Indonesian people don't like to read a book, especially a young people. Then what should old or young people do to make young people open their eyes of this destructive capitalism? I'm sorry if my question is silly. <laughs> There's nothing silly in your question. And in fact, I've already answered your question because um, I remember I had talked about how it's important uh, not to go among the people and, and talk about, uh, you know, the big words, you know, capitalism, socialism and so on. In fact, emphasize the immediate tangible issue before people, you know, uh, can their children go to school? Do they have shoes? I found out recently 1 billion people in the planet have no shoes. That's a real number. 1 billion people in the planet have no shoes. I wonder how many Indonesians have no shoes. Do they have shoes? Do they have access to health care? Um, you know, uh, do they eat and so on? These movements are built on these tangible issues. Then we advance the cause because what happens is how does somebody develop a socialist consciousness? You explore with people. Look, do you agree that there should be no hunger? Yes, we agree. Um, do you agree there's enough food? Yes, there's enough food. Look at the shops. They're filled with food. Why is the shop filled with food and a hungry person? Because they don't have money. Why don't they have money? You know, as you start having this conversation, you're leading people to a socialist consciousness. You're not imposing an idea. Um, you know, one of the great socialist teachers of our time was Paulo Freire. And Freire taught us that you have to start from where people are, not try to tell people where they, where they should be. And I think that's, to me, that's the essence of building any kind of political project. We start where people are, and then we'll go to where we think we should go. And, and we will also have to change our minds because where we end up may not be where you thought we'd end up. You know, because we, we are not clairvoyant. We can't see the future. But you must start where people are and deepen and deepen and deepen. Thank you, Mr. Vijay. Uh, I think we should start with our little circle. And thank you to let me be your last question. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I, I'll be, 
I will buy your books after this discussion. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pizan, for the discussion. It's been an interesting discussion, to say the least. We've been talking back and forth about Marxism, and, you know, even some people asked about the Indonesian left movement, which is, you know, it's the 30th of, of September, so it's been a deep discussion today. So I want to probably, you know, ask you a simple question, a layman's question, if you will, and you could probably uh, use it as your closing statement uh, of some sort. What do you think uh, is next for the Marxism uh, movement in the world? And, and what can we do to, you know, alleviate that uh, uh, consciousness, like you said, the socialist consciousness, as a layman or as a as a as a student in university, which is uh, what most of our participants are probably are. Well, you know, Raditya, I'm a stuck record on this because um, uh, I would say that the the problem for us is to get people out of cynicism and the feeling that nothing can change. You know, how do you bring people out of cynicism? Uh, that's a big malady. It's a problem. People believe nothing can change. Everybody's corrupt. You know, everybody's bad. You just let your family get, you know, some advantages and that's it. And after that, it's, it's a big joke, right? Um, we have to fight against cynicism and in order to fight against cynicism we have to start from first principles and that's why i emphasize these basic issues like hunger um i mean can a young person can any human being be cynical about hunger i, I hope not you know um i hope not i hope a young person cannot be cynical about hunger and if you start getting involved in abolition of hunger, not alleviation of hunger, not giving people, going out and feeding people only, but how to abolish hunger as, a, as part of the system, that will take us to socialism. That question will lift you into a socialist consciousness because you will realize that in the world we live in, they don't have any idea how to abolish hunger. The only country right now that has abolished absolute poverty has been China. And they did it by a very interesting mechanism. Again, in our institute, we released a report on the abolition of, of hunger. Um, take a look at that. Thanks a lot, guys. Nice to be with you on 30th September. It's a very sad and sober day. Um, it's a difficult day, you know. Um, it's not a day to celebrate anything. It's a black day for the world. And every year on 30th September, I think of people in Indonesia. I think of decent, sensitive people from one part of the archipelago to another who were massacred. Every year on 30th September, I feel surrounded by shadows. And so I'm, when, when, when Reza said, you know, this is the date, I thought, oh my gosh, that's either an accident or it's providence. All right, so thank you, Mr. Pichay. So everyone, if you want to have more discussion with Mr. Pichay, you can probably